world, you know, really serious limitations on free speech. Um, and this is very important, an understanding of democracy that is very, mature, very majoritarian in nature, that just says, I, I had 50% of the vote, or nearly 50% of the vote, and what I say goes. Um, and, if the, and that, I think you can hear in this rhetoric, you know, oh, you have 10,000 people, I have a million. Uh, uh, I, you know, they're just sore losers because they lost the election. Yes, they did live, lose the elections. Nobody's challenging that. But politics is about different, cons you know, different constituencies in the society being represented, understanding that they're in relatively different positions of power at any given moment, and trying to reach negotiated compromise settlements to thorny and difficult problems. It's not, I got 50 plus one of the votes, and now it's my way or the highway. I apologize. Could you come to your conclusion? Yes. Uh, you. uh, yeah. So I really, um, um, I think that I will conclude by saying that I'm very distressed by some of the way this has been covered in um, the American press which seems to, in my mind, to trivialize the events in Turkey by sort of one of the reports in the New York Times, not yesterday, maybe the day before, uh, sort of described it as, on the one hand, an Islamically rooted government confronting um, a bunch of uh, sort of uh, vegetarian uh, 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 New Age protesters. Um, and neither is it true that the government, while it is Islamically rooted, neither is it true that, they're, that they represent, quote unquote, somehow traditional Turkey, right? Nor is it true that the people who oppose them are just a bunch of, um, um, you know, kids who drink wheatgrass juice. Um, uh, there, are, there are serious political and social and ideological tensions at stake between both groups of people, and both groups of people, by the way, are rather modern in their, uh, you know, modernist as opposed to traditional in their social bases and in their orientations. Thank you. Um, I would like to remind the audience that um, after uh, each time um, a panelist concludes their points, you're welcome to um, ask questions, um, expand on the topic, or introduce new topics, um, as long as it's in between um, small speeches. Thank you. So would you, and the rest of our panel, would you agree uh, with Professor Chessori that the current government undermined the authority of this old order rather than establishing a new order? Would you think that the people, the people are writing against a, the replacement of, of a um, I mean, yes and no. Um, it's it's important to get the yes. I mean, it's it's really important to get uh, what is uh, who is the other fifty percent who is not out in the streets right now, right? Um, and you know, um, I may I may attempt to put like a partial picture for this. Um, even like Professor Schissler, I just start with the kind of political economy. Uh, it's um, so one of the one of the most important things that I think that the that the current government has done is to overcome uh, certain status quo um, kind of status differences that the, that the Turkish society had for a long, long time. Right? So um, from for from the perspective of a Kemalist, a secular governmentality, you would have um, Classes like teachers, lawyers, um, doctors uh, that are kind of lauded by the society and are seen as Bangor's society and so on. And uh, during 2006 and 2007, um, the government has undertook major transformation in social security and healthcare systems. And this has been primarily important in, 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 in um, hegemonizing kind of the population and, and gaining a lot of votes. Because I mean, so the, the old system used to work. For example, that if you were, if you belonged to these professional classes, you would get basically you would have, um, uh, enroll in a different social security system than someone who is from Anatolia and who is trying to uh, build a business and so on. So, um, 
they basically scratched off all the system and found this major bunch of associated with the system, right? And this has enabled someone who's coming from Manitoba and who wants to own a business and he wants to flourish to say, okay, we have equality now, right? We do not have to um, feel entangled by um, everlasting status quo or status um, distinctions that has been so much ingrained into our society. So, at least from like cultural economy perspective, perhaps this has attracted a lot of um, kind of valence for the RKP governments, right? And so, and so the the, the fact that um, many many of these riots have been happening in. Uh, in, in Ankara, in Istanbul, in Izmir, in, in, and also in the Kurdish region, but not in the, in, in the middle of the country so much yet, is kind of a telling of this. But things have been changing, so there, there is something more, I believe. There's something more to know. Um, well, I will, I, will, I will have to leave that a bit a poetic, maybe. But, um, and one of, the, one, of the, one of the big, big, big notions of, uh, of ways of kind of promulgating this policy has been through construction and has been through um, government-led, top-down um, policies of construction. I mean, to, to um, so, Toki is the Turkish Student Housing Association, which has been kind of um, vanguarding this construction policy for a long, long time. Uh, and it's, it's, it's responsible for about 80 or 90 percent of all the urban transformation that has been going on in Turkey. So this location of the uh, relocation of populations from the, from the middle of the city, kind of poor populations, and to uh, the outskirts of the cities, and moving uh, and building you know, more financially and clean um, districts in, in the middle of, especially Istanbul, so and so on and so forth. And uh, this institution is directly tied to the Prime Ministry. So um, the, the Parliament does not have um, direct right to kind of intervene in these policies. It's only post facto that the Parliament can say, well, you know, this site is this should be historic, this site is, this site is these policies are unruly, and so on and so forth. So I think, I, think um, I mean, if we take into account the fact that um, real estate has been so important lately, that um, golf is money especially has been flowing to the Middle East, and that the institution was directly tied to the Prime Minister, it, it, it makes sense why the Prime Minister himself takes these issues so much personally and has been so dire in, 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 in uh, maintaining his own ground compared to perhaps the other members of the Arctic. Um, the second point, maybe, um, which is important here is, of course, that around the Gezi Park, uh, there have been a lot of policies uh, effectuated in terms of urban transformation. Um, so, um, I guess you can talk about this later on, but it's, 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 so that's why, I mean, especially with, with, with the location we're talking about, this has been symptomatically expressed in uh, the Occupy Gezi movements. So. And um, I believe I, I mean I, I want to touch on one thing, one more thing, which is why there's so much of a uh, of a of a angst against the government this time, for example. And um, I believe like um, this can have many, many, many explanations. But one of the explanations that's potentially viable, I think, is because um, the government has succeeded a lot, but it could not strengthen the state. It could not say, okay, these decisions that are coming out of the parliament are democratic decisions that can be appreciated by everyone. So there has been endemic moral panic in the society because of this, and the government has been um, kind of um, expressing their own policies and transformative changes with a moralizing attitude, such as these petty um, decisions like banning the alcohol and so on and so forth, have been entangled with what we call torba kanu, so like mass chunks of law that um, kind of sets of law that have been passed altogether. Um, so that even though it, is, it creates more panic because it's like so disruptive for society, but along with them you have many neoliberal policies going on at the same time, which are kind of not really accessible for the population, so they do not realize what's going on. But um, so especially in the last two years, we had five or six of these um, mass chunks of kind of legislation that have been passed, and at the same time there has been um, vicious crackdown um, through the use of law. Right. Um, so crackdown on the military offices, crackdown on the ex vigilantes, deep state organizations, and crackdown on the Kurdish civil society. 
Um, I mean, you can't have many explanations to what's happening with these crackdowns. My explanation is that there's a huge utilization of politics, that the government tries to resolve the issues that, that, that cannot be resolved in the parliament um, through the use of law, through the use of prosecutors, and especially with, uh, after 2010, with the revisal of the, of the um, hard aid council of prosecutors, usually people are considering that right now the government has the right to appoint two prosecutors into the high councils. So you can see how um, there have been like top-down policies uh, ingrained into these crackdowns at the same time. And I believe this is kind of part of the reason why Erdogan today is being labelled as an authoritarian instead of as something that is someone who uh, enables or flourishes democracy. And um, in terms of the police, uh, maybe we can have like a few words on the police and why the police has been so so much vicious, um, which is not new, which has been some a policy that has been um, practiced, especially in the southeast, for the last uh, at least like six years, I would say, um, excessive tear gassing, excessive violence, and so on. And um, it, this this was not bereft of uh, its own moralizing language. If you if you open up the journal of the police that the Turkish police has, you can see many many sorts of policies that the police is trying to say. Okay, we have to Islamize the Kurds, for example, because they haven't uh, uh, not Islamized enough, for example, right? Or we have to uh, use more tear gas to 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 um, to uh, pacify the populations and so on and so forth. So even Though, um, you know, beyond rule of law, in practice of the police, I believe there has been a policy of seeing every kind of a dissentful uh, person as somewhat like a criminal or somewhat like a terrorist. Um, you know, it, it, whether it be, whether this is because of police pedagogy, whether this, this be because there's, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, government, civil society has so much in, uh, been um, fused into the police, which has been a discourse, um, people might be familiar with the book Imam al uh, which can translate as the, 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 the army of the Imam, um, yeah, which, has, which was a book uh, that was preacher, yeah, preacher of the, preacher of the, uh, yeah, yeah, the army of the preacher. Uh, so this, uh, this, this book was banned before it got published and um, its writer, a journalist called Ahmed Shik, was arrested uh, and he stayed in prison for a uh, year or a year and a half or something. Right, I mean, whether you approve of, um, whether you believe that everything has been written on the book is correct or not, it, it, it's, it, it's indicative of how much uh, policing has become uh, a, 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 a zone of moral contention in society. And kind of to wrap up, maybe um, we. Why is this? You know, how is this relevant with everything that's going on? How is this relevant with the political economy, with the government's transformation, and such? I believe, like, um, and this is kind of me speaking, kind of um, emotionally, maybe. But AKP has been the most neoliberal thing that Turkey has ever seen. And um, what what usually happens with neoliberal policies is that as soon as the government retreats from um, from uh, the economic sphere has to it has to uh, make it, make itself present in other spheres such as opinion. So this 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 creation of like every dissentful person as a criminal, as every dissentful person as a terrorist, is kind of hand in hand with with these economic policies. So that's my two cents. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if I may, um, just to see uh, what um, the point of view of the actual protesters who are present in Istanbul at the moment. We contacted one of uh, the University of Chicago graduates, an alumni, an alumnus, um, who majored in political science. Um, he's in Istanbul at the moment in Taksim Square, in the, in the hub of, of main events. We would like to Skype him um, for him to provide a few sentences for you, if that's possible. Um, thank you. Hi, Ali. 
We're in the middle of our panel. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity, and thank you for sparing your time. Of course, thank you for joining us. Uh, we've been discussing, um, we've mentioned, we've, um, we talked about a retrospective look into how the events progressed this much. Um, and if you'd like to add a few words and explain to us how the, the vibe is um, in the square right now and your point of view on the situation, we, we'd appreciate it. Of course, I'll, uh, I'll try not to take too much of your time. I know that we're all very busy, so uh, if, I, uh, if I start talking too much, please, uh, please tell me to stop and I will. Um, first of all, let me begin by saying that uh, I've been here with uh, my friends since Friday and uh, we've been here every week until uh, pretty much 4 or 5 a.m. and um, oh, second, I'm live, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm very sorry, people are uh, quite excited to see, I have another uh, press uh, agent with me who's, uh, who's watching what I'm doing right now, so uh, people are very curious as to what I'm doing right now, because I'm in front of one of the barricades that I, uh, I and my friends built uh, by myself for hours and hours under, under uh, police pressure. And if you can see the barricade right now, this is one of the smaller barricades. Uh, some of them are uh, as tall as three meters high. And, uh, well, let me, uh, let me give you a quick uh, recap of uh, what has happened. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sure that you guys already know by now, but uh, up until uh, Thursday, this was a very peaceful, very small protest. It was about uh, 50 or 100 people, uh, mostly environmentalists, trying to protect uh, some trees from uh, being enforced. And uh, the police attacked very brutally, and uh, they used tear gas and water cannon, and uh, you know it was, it was a very violent raid. And uh, what ended up happening is scores of people connected through uh, social media and gathered uh, around Taksim Square. On, uh, on Friday in the afternoon and uh, around the evening. And uh, what happened is there were very violent cra uh, clashes on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, tear gas potter cannon attacks continued on uh, Tuesday. These last two days have been very peaceful. No, um, especially around Istanbul, no um, tear gas has been sprayed in the last couple of days. But um, the weekend especially has been very troublesome. And uh, unfortunately, all of us, you know, you know middle-class, white-collar, uh, university-educated youngsters, we had to, uh, you know, band together, gather, and um, really actually learn guerrilla tactics to survive uh, this, this quite brutal attack. I mean, the first day, none of us were prepared. Um, I was pretty much in the same attire on Friday, but come Saturday, I had my gas mask, and I had my uh, swimming goggles, you know, people had hard hats, uh, gloves to uh, throw the, uh, uh, the grenades back and everything, and uh, what ended up happening is, um, on Friday and Saturday, uh, we had to fight on the side streets, but come uh, Saturday evening, the police had to retreat from uh, Taksim Square because uh, they were all very tired, they hadn't uh, lost in days, and uh, they haven't come to the square in days now, and people have set up huge barricades, I mean, some, some of these, I honestly don't know how people are going to, um, to uh, put aside at the, at, at the end of things. And uh, there have been no police here for days now, and uh, this has all been so peaceful. I mean, I, I honestly still shiver when I think of uh, the, uh, the cooperation and um, the, the fraternal atmosphere that is here. I mean, you know, there are as many female uh, people protest as there are male protesters, and people are here uh, representing the whole you know, uh, the, the full spectrum, I mean, you can see, uh, you know, uh, LGBT uh, members, you can see uh, Muslims with headscarves and everything, you can see leftists and rightists, you can see, uh, you know, lower income people, higher income people, and uh, now, right now, Taksim Square in Gezi Park is turned into uh, something akin to um, a utopic atmosphere where uh, money doesn't really change hands anymore, they're, they're hip -hop piles. people hand out uh, water and, uh, you know, supplies to people. There are now little hospitals and a library and people are planting uh, trees and everything and uh, this really is something that is truly unprecedented in Turkish history. I have a question for you um, yeah. regarding the nature of the movement. Do you consider it to be um, political? As I'm sure you're aware, there have been many talks as to whether the, whether the reason, the reasoning behind the many protesters, the, the main motivation was or wasn't political. What's your point of view? I'm actually, I'm actually very glad you uh, you asked me about this because uh, 
people used to say, I, I'm sure the, uh, the Turkish members at, uh, in, in the room right now will, uh, will tell you later, uh, the Turkish youth, youth right now uh, has traditionally been uh, you know, spoken about uh, as being apolitical. And uh, well, right now I can very clearly say that this movement is definitely not political in nature. Political parties play a very minimal role. Uh, it, it's mostly, it's very organic, it's very grassroots. And uh, I, I have to say, this isn't an apolitical movement. I have to uh, underline this very heavily. This is an anti-political movement. Because if, uh, if there had been any uh, opposition parties that actually uh, represented what we're trying to say here, then we wouldn't have needed to be here in the first place. This isn't apolitical, this is anti-political. Thank you very much. Would you like to add any further comments? <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me again? Well, I can hear you. Uh, well, oh, I, did, I didn't know that you were asking me. I thought you were asking uh, the audience. Oh, no, no, I was asking you. I apologize. I was asking you. Well, I can hear you, but I can't hear uh, if anybody else is asking any questions. So you might have to uh, rephrase the questions. Um, I will. Let's ask our audience. Do we have any questions? Do I desalt it? Thank you. We have, we have one question in the audience, I think. A couple. Um, what, is it, what is it exactly that the, the progress want? What's the goal? Is there a unifying goal? It's on the cell level. I did. I did. We have a question from the audience. Um, can I have your name? Eve. Eve is asking whether there's a goal behind the movement. Do, do the protesters have a unifying goal or certain demands? Sure, okay. Um, well, as I, as I've been all around uh, the square, uh, all around Gezi Park, and all around uh, the side streets leading up to uh, the square, and uh, as I've already told you guys, uh, it, this, this has been a very uh, eclectic crowd, a very diverse crowd, so uh, it's, uh, during the first few days, it's been very difficult to, uh, to put together a unified political message uh, because of uh, the anti-political atmosphere that's, uh, that's prevalent around here. And uh, I have to, during the first few days, especially under severe police pressure, this has been more of a reaction than an action. But now, uh, as, uh, as police suppression has subsided, it has become uh, a, a major goal for us to, uh, to come, come up with you know, basic, you know, uh, solid uh, goals that we, can, uh, you know, uh, that we can say that people will, uh, will listen to and uh, that, that we can... Um, you know, put together. So now, support groups are beginning to uh, put together a list of grievances and uh, out of, uh, you know, demands. Well, not demands necessarily, but uh, requests, let's say. So uh, at first, this was uh, a reaction, but now it's becoming, uh, it's turning into an action. So uh, now people are starting to uh, put together lists of grievances, uh, common points that, uh, that all people from all diverse backgrounds can rally upon. So uh, it's slowly turning into uh, the point where we can actually come up with a, a list of things to, uh, to demand and a list of things to say. Thank you. And can we have our second question? Yeah. Uh, there's been um, reports in the media about the ways in which, uh, about a few incidences where uh, Erdogan is portrayed as um, somebody, there's in cartoons, as wearing uh, uh, an Ottoman turban, an Ottoman emperor's turban. And I'm wondering, the, the reports of those instances, are those, um, is, that, is that kind of an exception, uh, an exceptional instance of the way that uh, Erdogan is portrayed, or is that, uh, do you find incidences of that kind of portrayal uh, more, uh, more and more common? Did you hear the question? Yeah, I, I, I did, I did, and uh, thank you for asking this, because this gives me the, uh, the opportunity to tell you about the, uh, the humorous aspect of, uh, of this whole uh, resistance. Because this resistance has really come up with its own, um, say, uh, its own sense of humor. And uh, I, I have to tell you, uh, the whole of Thompson Square and Istiklal Avenue and all the side streets is full of graffiti on the walls, on the floors, and, uh, you know, hatred. Well, yeah, I, I have to say the word hatred. Hatred of Thay Erdogan is very prevalent around here. And he really is seen as uh, a true autocrat, a true uh, dictator. I mean, people aren't. That, uh, that upset with the AKP government itself, but people are really, really, really upset and, uh, you know, grievous towards uh, Taib Adwan himself. So, uh, yeah, exactly. Pe people do really view him as a true dictator with an iron fist akin to, uh, say, let's say. Thank you very much, Ali, uh, for connecting and pro providing very valuable thoughts from the actual field. My pleasure.
We very much appreciate it. Good luck over there. Moving on to our panelists here. Um, I guess my main question um, right now would be um, just if you could focus your points around what happens next in the context of what do you think this movement can accomplish? Can these accomplishments be sustained? Um, to be more specific, do you think um, since I mentioned moving from this from his comments that um, most of the protests are directed at Tayyip Erdogan, the Prime Minister himself? Uh, would you say that he will resign or his government will resign? Or do you think that this movement might have, I mean, do you think um, in any way, even if they do or do not resign, um, this movement might affect the outcome of the, the upcoming elections in 2014, for, for example? Well, uh, it will definitely affect the uh, outcome of anything from uh, now on in Turkey. And I'm going to just limit myself to, say, 10 minutes, because we have three more panelists, and we're supposed to be done at 8. Maybe we could extend it, but not, not too much. So um, the list of demands that uh, only mentioned uh, that I've been put together are actually, uh, it's very good to hear uh, from somebody from the grassroots that there are demands that the grassroots want and are, uh, are putting together. Because uh, the Taksim resistance uh, that uh, flourished over the last 10 days has behind it a year and a half of organized struggle by NGOs and uh, professional associations and all sorts of civil society actors, uh, minor political parties, uh, against uh, a top-down and uh, exclusive way of uh, redesigning the city. And, uh, you know, a lot of people through platforms and solidarity movements have uh, expressed grievance. And there are already existing networks. Those networks have put together demands and uh, those demands have been, right now, uh, delivered to the uh, government uh, by representatives and are being negotiated, uh, or at least the government knows of those. Uh, what the protesters, in terms of uh, organized protest there, rather than the grassroots forming their own um, demands which will get expressed uh, in time and this is just the beginning it's just going to go on even after the years that's for sure in Turkey uh, but the demands that are delivered are first and foremost we want the park to stay apart we don't want any uh, you know, plaster castle built and turned into a shopping mall there, there. Uh, the second thing is uh, we want those responsible for the police violence uh, meaning the governor of Istanbul and the uh, uh, head of security of uh, everywhere where there has been police violence to resign or be taken uh, from the duty, dismissed. Uh, the third demand, uh, well, the two and a half demand, is uh, an end to the use of tear gas, period. Uh, no use of tear gas whatsoever. Uh, I need to look up. Uh, the uh, final demand is, uh, is freedom of uh, gathering and protest in all squares and in all public spaces in Turkey. And there is one more demand that just escaped. Hmm? Media. Media? Yeah. That, that's not a demand. No, that's not a demand. But that's a grievance. Uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, it's both uh, geared toward, these are all acceptable demands, I mean, you know, even though everyone on the streets, including people in Gezi Park and including people elsewhere in Turkey, are chanting, 
We zijn naar de lang. Met al de langs. Tering met al de langs. Dat is niet wat de maatstaf is delivered. Ik ga nu misschien evalueren de situatie een beetje van de punt van view. Why it is such a momentous affair? Uh, Turkey had its revolution from above in the early republic. Uh, then you had three coups where you know society was ordered from above. The AKP came, uh, and it was significant that uh, it had a popular basis, but it found its legitimacy in the popular base, rather than in any ideology, whatever. But uh, it was not fundamentally different from the previous modernist uh, governments and uh, centers of power in Turkey, in the fact that while getting uh, its le legitimacy from a broader popular base, it still acted very much from above. I mean. Uh, for the AK party, it's, you know, every four years you go to the ballot, uh, renew your legitimacy, and then push on a program of you know, growth that is violent uh, against uh, local populations and against uh, nature all over Turkey. You don't consult with anybody, there is no sense of participatory democracy whatsoever, and the legitimacy comes from the ballot box. Uh, that's the whole difference. Uh, this movement is hugely unexpected, even for everybody on the ground, activists, uh, and so on. Uh, and you know, is beyond comprehension in that it is the first grassroots movement that Turkey has produced in, I would say, over two centuries, uh, since the modern period, essentially. And uh, it's just incredible how people are uh, spontaneously coming together and uh, discussing, and uh, you know, especially what's going on in Gezi elsewhere. Yes, there is. Uh, an anti-government sentiment that is bringing people together, and that's sometimes it. It's old guard versus uh, new guard, as uh, the AKP wants to uh, portray it uh, in some centers. But definitely in Gezi and elsewhere as well in Turkey, it's just a huge hodge, hodge mix of people, as he was saying, discussing and getting to know each other, united around fundamentally two or three things. One of those things, uh, and, and I'm running out of time, is how, it goes back to how the uh, protests and resistance started at the beginning of uh, last week. Uh, this was started as a peaceful protest by Greens and uh, you know allies of Greens. Uh, camping very peacefully in a city park in a public space to protect it. Uh, a public space where there was no legal um, decision about whether or not it could be demolished, demolished yet. So it was a, a real citizen action. And uh, while some other left protests that the police is used to in Turkey have been violent in not so much their use of uh, violence, but in terms of their language and in terms of how they confront the police. You know, uh, it's like walking on the police, uh, etc. Uh, and you know, a damn against us sort of uh, old left mentality. Uh, this was a real non-violent resistance in all sense of the word and. The fact that this was crushed again and again by a special branch of the police uh, infuriated a whole generation of people uh, in a way that nobody expected. And 
that's how it uh, flourished and became the movement that it is. Uh, the thing I see that unites people, whether this be you know, Kemalist friends of mine from college, sort of uh, people who believe in the old ideology to a degree, whether it be my more uh, pro-Ottoman, uh, etc., childhood uh, family friends, whether it is just regular folk on the street or it's my activist friends uh, who've been involved in this for ages. Uh, the thing that unites people all over Turkey is, one, an end to police brutality, period. This is unacceptable. Uh, we will not have a state that uses violence of this sort and this degree against you know, its people who are just voicing demands. The second thing is uh, an understanding that the idea of democracy that is practiced in Turkey right now is simply not acceptable. Uh, and there is no participatory institutions uh, other than very uh, formal ones. And there is no culture of participatory democracy. And people obviously see that this is not enough. Uh, when you know, your prime minister time and again it goes up on the stage and says, uh, well, we, we did it, so that is the case. And you're going to have to live with it because uh, we have legitimacy in the people who vote for us, but also we, legit, we have legitimacy because we represent the authentic uh, culture of these uh, lands. Uh, that is a significant otherizing uh, discourse that uh, the AK party uses, and that just puts people off. Uh, it's just, you know, pushing your conservative view of what Turkish society is on others, and that's something that this new political